this video is looking at the Tiger by William Blake, and you're probably studying this for an exam, especially if you're doing Edexcel IGCSE. So what we're going to do is look at it up to exam standard, and then maybe have a think at the end of it about what we can compare it to or what questions uh, might frame it with, with other poems. So I'm going to assume that you've read the poem through and just to scroll through it very slowly so you can have a chance to read it if you haven't seen it before. And so that will take us all the way to the bottom there. And then kind of starting um, from, the, from the beginning. So we've got title wise, the tiger, don't um, worry about the archaic, the old fashioned spelling of tiger. We know that from the, the title, our focus is on um, the animal. And we're looking at it in, in two ways. We're looking at, at it as a kind of um, example of natural power and wonder and strength and beauty in a lot of ways. But we're also looking at it as a symbol of ferocity. And as Blake seems to frame it kind of um, like malevolence or evil in, in some ways. There is also a psychoanalytical reading of the poem that um, looks at people's psyches and people's minds. So we're then using the tiger to get into the debate about good and evil and the existence of a God who can create both. So kind of notes wise, what we might want to do is just put here, you know, that it is both um, beautiful and ferocious. So we have something which is the epitome, so the height of both power and creation, but also destruction because this poem is made up of a series of rhetorical questions, which are basically um, kind of making us think about the circumstances in which the tiger was created. So having kind of focused us with, with the um, title, The Tiger, and you may know that this poem appears in a collection called Songs of Experience, which is the partner collection to Songs of Innocence, um, you know, it is it's looking at the tiger as a kind of something that is a more negative um, image. But we've got tiger, tiger. So in those two words, in that repetition, and if you can remember repetition, that's that's great. But the two techniques going on here are apostrophe, okay, which is where you have an address to a a thing that isn't, you know, at present, it's slightly more abstract. So the idea that we're addressing the tiger makes it apostrophe. And the type of repetition it is, is episoixis. Okay, that's where you get a word repeated with nothing in between the two words, right? So tiger, tiger, burning bright. And, you know, the minute you start reading this, you're gonna pick up about the fact that it's written in rhyming couplets. Um, don't be fooled by the I symmetry. You know, it is a it is a language shift thing. I symmetry, E symmetry. Um, you know, it it is meant to be a full rhyme there. And we've got tiger, tiger, burning bright, and that image of fire, right, is kind of indicative of duality, right? Because we have you know fire, which is attractive, necessary, which is a, a kind of advantage of everything. It is, you know, life giving, heat giving, or, or life kind of um, preserving from the warmth of it. But it's also potentially incredibly dangerous and destructive and, and can injure you. So in the same way that, you know, fire burns with an attractive but deadly flame, so does this tiger have that sort of same kind of tension there. You might want to use the word dichotomy to show that there is a tension between the two. So tiger, tiger, burning bright, and we have the alliteration there, the kind of consonants of the T and the plosive alliteration of the B to really kind of bring that impact and that force to the first line. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. And again, looking at that kind of psychoanalytical 
reading of it, I'll just give you the word psyche there to mean the mind, you've got the idea that our tiger literally is in a forest, is in a dark forest. You can see the difference in its colour and in its kind of animation and its power against this natural backdrop. But we've also got this kind of psychological tiger in the in the night of the human psyche, maybe, you know, that, that there is this kind of um, evil or power or some sort of more malevolent force driving through the human darkness. OK, so just bearing in mind, it can it can represent both things. And then see, we've got end stop, end stop, giving it, it this kind of um calculated sort of thought and working out feeling so that it, it, it's kind of a, not quite a ponderous because that would imply it's more more slow but it's certainly considered um from the end stops there but what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry okay and there's the interesting kind of concepts there because the speaker is going straight away to the idea that well you know there is a higher power that must have designed this animal you know both created it seen it envisaged it um and to frame something to to construct it to make it but symmetry which is usually taken as a positive thing you know the the human mind likes balance and likes things to match and things to kind of come full circle etc but for some reason this symmetry is fearful is is awe inspiring in a more kind of original sense of the word and so there is this planning behind the tiger which makes it awesome you know we are filled with awe at that point but there is a kind of beauty you know fearful symmetry is almost oxymoronic um because you would think that symmetry in the concept of blake's time was a was a positive thing now we have this juxtaposition of light and darkness. The, you know, the tiger is burning in the night. Um, we have the fearful symmetry, the contrast there. So we are kind of establishing straight away a, a dilemma, a dichotomy, um, a conflict, a tension before we even get past the first quatrain, quatrain being a four line um, stanza. And the rest of the poem is made up of... of um, questions and I think that has to be a comma I would just check in your version I've got this off the internet so Poetry Foundation has put it as a full stop but please just check your version to to see what the punctuation is there um okay so we move to in what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes okay so that question we're dealing with the setting the location where have you come from and it has to be one of the extremes. You know, as far as this speaker is concerned, the tiger must have come from, you know, some somewhere where, you know, it is not a natural human dwelling place. And the fire of uh, the tiger's eyes has come from there. This is going to question the kind of start of the tiger. Where was the tiger kind of conceived? Where was it framed? So... The fire must have come first. And, you know, our, our second question. And on what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? So this, this kind of idea of daring is going to come back in the final line as well, because the final line repeats that line just with dare frame thy fight, fearful symmetry. Um, this idea of being challenged to do something, being able to do something, pushing boundaries. And the minute you get onto um, boundaries and things and talking about fire, you maybe start to have that Promethean illusion. And an illusion is an indirect reference. So to allude. OK. And Prometheus was um, uh, stole fire from the gods. Prometheus kind of became way too fond of humanity and he had been forbidden by Zeus from giving humanity fire. Um, and yet he decided his loyalty was with humanity. So he stole fire to give it to the people. And as a punishment for that, 
uh, Zeus decreed that Prometheus had to have his liver pecked out every day um, by eagles and every night it would grow back and every morning it would start to be pecked out again. So this idea of kind of a Promethean overreacher is some somebody or something that is pushing the boundaries and the idea that whichever immortal hand or eye, whichever kind of um, entity made the, the tiger, you know, was it going too far? What the hand dare sees the fire? You know, um, how far did we, you know, how, what did you, what did you, uh, what lengths would you go to to make this happen? So in a way, this is quite challenging because it's kind of questioning the motivation and the actions of God. And we start to realise that we've got form and structure wise, we've got a pattern. These these couplets are carrying on, giving it this uh, um, sense of drive and sense of rhythm. The meter is generally kind of trochaic, but isn't trochaic tetrameter. It's kind of missing a beat a lot of the time. So tiger, tiger, burning bright. You can see there that we're missing a syllable. OK, otherwise it would be tiger, tiger, burning brightly. Right. Um, but you get that trochaic beat there. Apart from, I think, this line, um, then we move to could twist that one. Um, and when we've got some iambic stuff coming in. So I think later on down here and waters, that's another iambic line. And this is an iambic line. So yes, we must have the yes, we've got the stop because it's it's got to be that one. It's got to be um iambic as well. So we've got um this mixture of of kind of regular-ish beats between trochaic and iambic. Um and I am de dum troche dum de, um, but creating this kind of pattern, this drive, and this real kind of desire or strength to kind of know the answers to these questions. Looking at the kind of setting, we move from there to then the kind of body of the tiger and what shoulder. So we start to get this polysyndeton building up in this stanza, keeping adding, you know, what happened, what happened. Now, they've written it as an ampersand there, but I don't know if it's an and in your um, copy. But we've certainly got, you know, the idea that there are all sorts of these elements of the tiger building up. So you can say, you know, the polysyndeton, um, polysyndetic listing, you could talk about the anaphora, the repetition there of and what and when and what. Um, oh, we've got another one there. So you've got watch hold of what art could twist the sinews of thy heart. So we're addressing the, the tiger directly still. The twisting of the sinews there, that kind of echo is almost looking at the interwoven strength and connection of the, the internal workings of the tiger. So we've got the power from the shoulder and we've got you know the creativity, the art, the skill that went into it twist the sinews of my heart, the kind of, this kind of musculature of the, the, the beating heart. And when the heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? So, you know, what has started this? How has it started? Interesting, we get, a, we get an iambic line when we're talking about the heart, which could be echoing the heartbeat. And what dread hand, what dread feet? You know, this, this dreadful in terms of powerful, um, for both the thing that dared to make it and the, the thing itself, the tiger itself. So having considered where this took place and what it made, they're then looking at how it was made. You know, what kind of tools do you use to make a tiger? And Blake goes to the imagery um, connected with the smithy or the forge if you think of um, people beating iron and then tempering iron and, and, and kind of, it's got this idea of the massive heat and strength and process and craftsmanship, right? That, that all go to this. And I'm thinking that that punctuation might just be something you check in your anthology as well. Um, so we've got this idea of the hammer and the anvil and the kind of furnace. It's being aligned with, again, the fire, 
and the heat and the kind of power of the process. And I think we have to also, you know, say that there may be a kind of allusion to this diabolical imagery, diabolical related to the devil almost. You know, it's it's questioning how could God have done this when really the tiger seems to be maybe more aligned with evil, with destruction, with the kind of worst things in the world. So we we end up with these questions and the quick fire of the questions. It's almost like the kind of beating of something on on the anvil. So grasp and clasp that kind of sense of, of closing in. I guess, from, from the, that full rhyme. And again, we've got the um, plosive alliteration. Again, hammering out the kind of strength of the manufacture. And we go down from kind of, well, how was it made to an almost kind of cosmic level? Because, you know, now the tiger has been made, we look at the reaction of the universe when the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. So, you know, what was the reaction there on this higher level and then again anaphora that that kind of repetition did he you know the reaction of the creator um did he smile his work to see did he who made the lamb make thee so how did god react having made a thing of such power and such beauty if indeed implicitly it was god who made him um the idea that nature kind of throws down it, it spears the stars and watered heaven you know this is an extreme reaction of the universe being triggered by the the completion of the tiger and the rhetorical question did he smile his work to see you know implies that there must have been a pride in this and did he who made the lamb make thee relates not only to um see you know the the innocence of the lamb and the lamb being a sign for jesus in the bible you know the kind of innocence and and everything lord is my shepherd etc but in songs of innocence the parallel poem the sister poem to this uh poem in songs of experience is the lamb so blake is inviting you to kind of compare the two poems and say hang on how can we have something that's so innocent and something that's so um corrupt I guess or, or, or that's so kind of potentially evil and the poem is really kind of inviting you to think about that that age-old debate of, of you know how can a benevolent god allow evil and sorrow and suffering in the world and a lot of people sort of suggest that you know there can be no um understanding without both you know that that you know, you can't have the innocence and you can't have the goodness without having the, the evil. You know, you've got to have that idea of free will for the whole thing to work. We then come back to um, the first stanza, the first quatrain, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the Forest of Night. What immortal hand do I dare frame, my thy, uh, dare frame thy fearful symmetry? So we've gone from could to, you know, who could possibly make this tiger to, okay, if you can make the tiger, would you dare make the tiger? With the implicit kind of answer that, yes, God dared make the tiger. Why? And it comes back to that kind of question of, of good and evil. Um, so the changing the, the could to dare is significant. And it implies that, you know, we can't understand or humanity would not be able to understand this as part of any divine plan, that all we can do is question in the face of, of you know, um, God's decisions and, and the creator's kind of ideas to, to make things and, and plan for us. Okay, looking at this and thinking about which poems it could be matched with, obviously you might get anything on power, you might get something on power of nature you might get um some ideas of i suppose intensity or or um kind of strong feeling could could come through um i mean i'm just looking down the list of, of the ed excel poems you know tigers there you know we've got natural force do not go gentle into that good night could be one, you know, the inevitability and power of death versus, you know, the power of nature. 
um, we've got you know, the idea of intensity of feeling could come into a lot of these poems. Um, prayer before birth, the idea of, you know, a speaker questioning their world, wondering what's happened, wondering about the presence of good and evil and, and your place in the world. Um, it, Tiger is, is, a, is a great poem. There's an awful lot to say about it. And I think if you start to appreciate it on a, on a more symbolic level, as well as just uh, thinking about the, the tiger and, and do get your head around the stuff about Prometheus and, and the illusion and the uh, psychoanalytical reading, it does become an interesting debate on the nature of mankind that will go quite nicely with something like Magnesia's Prayer Before Birth. Okay, I hope that helps. Um, good luck.